Uh, this is the new book, um, Science Friction. To put it in the context of the larger body of work, this is the uh, trilogy, as it's called. My publisher calls this the trilogy. Now, why people believe weird things, God, and morality, to put it simply. <laughs> and this is an essay collection and then my biography of, of uh, Wallace. Oh, I forgot the uh, book on the Holocaust deniers, Denying History. Anyway, uh, and just as a little bit of sort of parenthetical note on, on publishers. Once you turn in the manuscript, the publishers take over production and they think they know what's best on covers and titles and things like that. And you really have to fight for it. This was, just for fun, the original cover of the new book, Science Friction. So they sent this to me and in a very unscientific way, they said, we've decided this is the best cover. And I said, well, how about like two or three samples and you do a market test or go down to the local borders and ask people which the three do you like the best and they said well no we don't do that I said I know but that's how you would do it if you did science a little bit of a test <laughs> and uh, and then I, I I couldn't quite pinpoint what I didn't like about this cover I didn't like the co color and stuff and I realized this is a horseshoe magnet this is magnetism in its friction so I pointed this out. I said, this would be a bad start for a science book if you can't even get the right icon correct. Anyway, that's... So I threatened to not do any book tours if they didn't change the cover, so they came up with that. It's a, it's a match striking, so it's a friction, right? It's, and the cover actually is kind of a, like a rough match box kind of surface. Anyway, so where the known meets the unknown is the subtitle. This is what we do, really. It's an extension, of course, everything I do here at Skeptics. We're exploring where the, that sort of borderlands, that gray area between science and pseudoscience and non-science and junk science and voodoo science and pathological science and nonsense and all that good stuff. Uh, that's where the action is. Stephen Wolfram's theory on you know, the new kind of science. What's, what's that? Is there something there? It's not really pseudoscience. It's not really mainstream science. What is it? That's the kind of stuff we like to deal with. Not Roswell, did it happen or did it not happen? That's kind of a boring subject to me now, but how it got to be such a huge story and it, that didn't happen. Roswell didn't become Roswell until 1980. So that's the story, not what happened in 1947, but what happened culturally in the 1980s to launch that as the mecca of ufology. So what we're doing as always is with science and skepticism, we're looking for natural explanations for all phenomena. Now it's possible aliens came from uh, planet Vega and, and made a crop circle uh, in, in the name of our uh, web page as a cosmic promotion of skeptic.com or some kind soul made this on Photoshop and sent it to us. So take your choice on the likeliest hypothesis. And again, before we say something is out of this world, we have to first make sure that it's not in this world. It's possible that Iron has got some help extraterrestrial help in his run for the governorship in our, um, our recall election in, in California. And, uh, or, or maybe, you know, the World Weekly News is not the most reliable news source. By the way, I've been tracking the kind of iconography of aliens and what they look like for many decades now. This is the first alien I've ever seen who has a big bicep and a nice workout, <laughs> buffed up body. Aliens on the uh, Arnold workout program, and I thought uh, those of you from California, well, this is Danny DeVito, the actor who actually does look a little bit like Cruz Bustamante, our, our lieutenant governor. Which <laughs> I thought that's pretty clever for even for these guys. <laughs> so we are pattern-seeking, storytelling primates, attempting to find meaning in an apparently meaningless universe. So I begin with just the simple task of uh, asking you, audience participation, non-rhetorical question: How many squares are there there? So it would take like 20 seconds to count them. Okay, I've heard 16, 26, 30, hike. Yeah, so there's, the, of course, the initial uh, response that you get from a, searching for the first pattern, 4x4 four four is 16. Of course, the whole thing is a square is 17. Then you have the 2x2s, two 2x2, by 2x2, two, 2x2, two by 2x2, two, two by two, two by two, two by two, and so forth. It gives you 26. And then there's four of these giant 3x3 three three squares. So it's one of these things, I actually take this to uh, grammar schools, uh, lower schools and middle schools. Kids have fun with it. It takes them a little bit longer. Uh, actually, it takes them a little bit shorter than most adults, but uh, to get that. Um, and it reminds me of this, that's how I opened the book, actually, that old Persian tent maker and occasional poet, Omar Khayyam, well captured the human dilemma of the search for meaningful patterns in an apparently meaningless cosmos. Into this universe and why not knowing 
nor whence like water willy-nilly flowing, and out of it as wind along the waste, I know not whither willy-nilly blowing. So that's what we're trying to do, figure out what we're doing here. And for the first time, we have a method that can actually help us figure it out. Not in some arbitrary way, but in a systematic way, deeply flawed as it may be, it's still the best system we have, and I'm, of course, talking about science. And I begin in the history of science, I think, is a good place to start with where modern science arises, with the 17th century English philosopher Francis Bacon in his great 1620 work, Novum Organum, or the new tool, or the new organ, patterned after Aristotle's organon, which was more uh, systematic logic and reason as the road to truth, which is one way to do it. But Bacon said we also have to look and have empirical data. It's both data and theory, empiricism and reason, observation and logic. He called this the great instauration, as nicely captured in the woodcut frontispiece of his book uh, with the ship of science, this new organon, this new tool of science, sailing out between the pillars of Hercules, which is variously located, but I think best at the Straits of Gibraltar, and the vast unknown where perhaps the lost continent of Atlantis is as the ships go out there. That's the best tool we have for exploring the unknown is, is science. However, Bacon was very um, insightful in understanding the psychology of beliefs and cognitive bias, what we would call cognitive biases. He called these idols. Idols are what we would call these cognitive biases, things that interfere with the data coming in uh, and how the theories and ideas that we hold um, filter the data and, and color it in a particular direction. He had four of these. He called them the idols of the cave, peculiarities of thought unique to the individual that distort how facts are processed in a single mind. Your mind, my mind, how, how I was raised, my particular way of thinking colors the way I see the world. Idols of the marketplace, uh, the limits of language, that is how we communicate, uh, causes confusion. Are we talking about the same thing? When somebody says it's evolution's only a theory, well then what do you mean by theory? That's how we have to talk about the world. That leads to confusion. Idols of the theater, pre-existing beliefs, like theater plays, may be partially or entirely fictional, and these influence how we process and remember facts. So that's more of a kind of a social, collective thing. And then idols of the tribe, this would be sort of a Darwinian, how we are built as a species, the inherited foibles of human thought endemic to all of us, the tribe, the species that places limits on knowledge. Bacon says, idols are the profoundest fallacies of the mind of man, nor do they deceive in particulars, but from a corrupt and crookedly set predisposition of the mind, which doth, as it were, rest and infect all the anticipations of the understanding. So Bacon actually uses this example, although I, he, not a swimming pool with a cleaning pole, but, but, the, but a beam in, a, in water, and how the beam is bent. You can see it's bent, but you don't think that the pole is physically bent, but even knowing that it's straight, you can't help but see that it's bent. And he described it this way, for the mind of man is far from the nature of a clear and equal glass, wherein the beams of things should, be ref should reflect according to their true incidence. Nay, it is rather like an enchanted glass, full of superstition and imposture, if it be not delivered and reduced. And I like, that, I like that metaphor of the enchanted glass, the mind as an enchanted glass, nicely captured here in M.C. Escher's self-portrait. Um, this is that, that sort of fuzzy borderlands, that fringe area between the known and the unknown. It's hard to tell. Some things are clear and obvious, others are not, and that's where the idols kick in. So I thought I'd just go over some of these, uh, from light and fun stuff to more serious things. Uh, most of you have probably seen the old woman, young woman illusion from uh, psych textbooks. This is something probably loosely associated with the idol of the theater. The classic experiment is this, is if you show, this is the, the neutral image. There's actually three images, a strong young woman, a strong old woman, and this is the neutral one. So with the young woman, here's her chin, her little pug nose, ear, and her eye.